celebrating 40 seasons on the air. Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, we're breaking down the highlights of Mississippi's 95th Annual Farm Bureau Federation meeting. We'll introduce you to some of this year's winners that are setting the example for other farmers across the state. Oh Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree, they're fun to pick out and decorate, but what do you do when Christmas is over? We'll give you environmentally friendly ideas to make sure your tree doesn't go to waste. And it's apparent you're missing out when it comes to your fruit choices. We're dropping some knowledge on the food that always takes a back seat to apples and oranges. Its health benefits may surprise you. And do you want to go to the beach? It's not for vacation, but something much more important than that. See how folks are doing their part to keep the environment and marine wildlife happy and healthy. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Troy Mulling. Thanks for joining us today here on Farm Week. Leighton, I hope you're ready. Hope you're gearing up for Christmas. Can and you, it's almost here. Can you believe it? I can. I'm definitely excited. It is almost here. And we've got a lot to tell you about. I'm excited about today's show. And starting off, a farm family from near Collins will represent Mississippi in a national competition next month in Arizona. The Young Farmers and Ranchers Achievement Award presentation was just one highlight of Farm Bureau's recent annual meeting in Jackson. I just want to say that we have had such stiff competition and it was incredible to be surrounded by all of these people. Young farmers are just doing an incredible job and I just, I'm just so grateful for this opportunity. Thank y'all. Shannon Rogers and her husband Levi were named the Young Farmers and Ranchers Achievement Award winner by Farm Bureau earlier this month. The couple run a large cattle operation in South Mississippi near Collins. We just buy about basically a 400 pound uh, yearling calf, heifer, steer, bull, and uh, raise them up. We sell the steers about 750 to 800 pounds and uh, grow the heifers to about 700. And uh, myself personally and Shannon, we, uh, we do about 4,000 head on our own. The Covington County couple will represent Mississippi in the National Young Farmers and Ranchers competition in January in Phoenix. Also recognized by Farm Bureau in Jackson was Jessica Graves of Starkville. Well, Jessica was presented the Young Farmer and Ranchers Excellence in Agriculture crying. Award for 2016. <laughs> Jessica is an instructor and the undergraduate coordinator in the Department of Animal and Dairy Science at Mississippi State. The Farm Woman of the Year Award for 2016 was presented Southern to JoLynn Mitchell so of Covington excited. County. Her family's huge agro-tourism operation is now in its 10th year and has been featured in the past on Farm Week. It's, it really means a lot to me. Anyone that knows me knows that agro-tourism and our farm has been very important to me. Um, I see a lot of people here, I saw a lot of people here today that have helped me along the way and have helped our farm and I really, really want to thank you for that. Farm Bureau Volunteer Leader Jan Hill of Chickasaw County was recognized with the Excellence in Leadership Award at the annual meeting and the organization presented two Distinguished Service Awards this year. The first went to Okalona Farmer and State Legislator Preston Sullivan and the second Distinguished Service Award went to former Mississippi Cattlemen's Association Executive Officer Sammy Blossom. From Jackson, I'm Leighton Spann reporting. Do you want to add a treasured family tradition to your Christmas season? In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman tells you how an annual trip to the Christmas tree farm may be just right for your family. While growing up in Michigan, one of my favorite Christmas memories was going out to the farm to pick out the tree to bring home. Down here in Mississippi, many families have a similar tradition. Today I'm at Tom Lee's Christmas Tree Farm in Hattiesburg getting ready for the holiday season. 
The Tomley family has been growing Christmas trees since 1967. There are three varieties of trees being grown here that have adapted to our southern growing conditions. Leyland cypress is one of the most popular Christmas trees grown in the south. The foliage of Leyland cypress varies, but generally is arranged in irregular flat planes with a dark green to gray coloration. Virginia pine has been a workhorse for southern Christmas tree growers for many years. The short needles are arranged in pairs and add interest with their twisted structure. Consistent pruning results in tight branching. Carolina Sapphire is an improved selection of Arizona Cypress. The gray-green leaves are plentiful and arrange close to the stems and appear scale-like. This tree is aromatic with a scent of combined lemon and mint. A Christmas tree farm is no different than any other farm. Each year the Tomleys plant at least a thousand transplants for future years. As these trees grow, Careful pruning transforms the trees into the familiar pyramidal Christmas tree shape. It usually takes at least five years of shaping and pruning to turn a scrawny transplant into a glorious family Christmas tree. You too can create wonderful family memories of that annual trip to cut your own Christmas tree. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. So of course a fresh cut Christmas tree can be a fun family activity and a beautiful addition to your Christmas decorations, but what about when the holidays are over? Don't just toss it to the curb. I spoke with a wildlife expert who has some ideas for tree cycling. In the United States, people purchase about 30 million trees for the Christmas season. 30,000 of those come from Mississippi, which adds almost $2 million to the industry. That's a lot of green and a lot of trees that have the potential to be thrown away. Even though trees are biodegradable, they have very fibrous branches and so they take a long time to decompose. And um, the EPA is saying that over 26% of landfill contents are actually recyclable. Tech suggests recycling your tree could be an option. Did I say recycling? Make that tree cycling. Tree cycling is something that has been coined by a group called Earth 911, and it really is a, sort of a new trend where people understand and learn about a way to reuse the tree instead of putting it in a landfill. There are a number of ways you can make sure your tree lives on long after you undeck the halls. I recommend buying a potted tree. That way in January when the, the soil is soft and the climates of Mississippi are fairly mild, you can actually plant that tree and make that maybe a new family tradition. You can also chop up your own tree, put it in your compost, and then in the spring you'll have a very nice nutrient dense uh, mulch for your garden. You can uh, actually put the tree in a pond or on a shoreline and uh, prevent erosion. You can give a small shelter for birds or other small animals that, that need some warmth in the winter and a little place to hide from predators. Tech also mentions Earth 911's website has a list of different organizations who will haul away your old tree for free or for just a few bucks. It's a small price to pay for the opportunity to help the environment this holiday season. Dr. Tech also says that for every Christmas tree cut down, three seedlings are planted. So when you buy a real tree, you're helping the environment. Well, when we think about fruit, the usual suspects are apples, oranges, and bananas. But what about pears? In this week's episode of The Food Factor, MSU Extension's Natasha Haynes tells us why we should consider adding pears to the fruit bowl. It's so great being an apple. Look at all the things you can make with us. We're vibrant, crisp, and delicious. People love us. What's wrong, Pear? Did I hurt your feelings? When it comes to a tasty, healthy snack, pears may not get the recognition that apples do, but they have just as much reason to be in the limelight. Pears are sodium-free, cholesterol-free, and fat-free. They are an excellent source of fiber, pack only a mere 100 calories, and don't require any prep to enjoy. Pears are also just as versatile as apples and can be used in a variety of dishes, 
from hot oatmeal with cinnamon pears for breakfast to a fresh pear salad for lunch. They can also be poached or baked for a delicious and healthy dessert. And don't forget, if you're slicing some pears up for a fruit tray, give them a dash of citrus juice to keep them from browning. Well, you know what they say, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. So what's a pear for? <laughs> well, apparently we're used in certain logos. <laughs> Let me get this one real quick. Hit it. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. What a pear, hey? Yeah, what a pear. <laughs> and indeed, there are over 3,000 varieties of pears, I understand, worldwide. Wow, I may have to start adding some pears to my diet after that. Another thing I always want to add to my diet, the markets with Layton. What's in the news for us today? Well, since you want to talk about food today, a fast food chain is thinking about adding more breakfast choices that feature a notable meat, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But first, the nation's cotton crop gets bigger. Chicken producers may see higher feed costs, while cattlemen may have more opportunity in the new year. Well, no surprises in the December 9th crop reports for corn and soybeans. The supply and demand numbers for each of these crops are the same as they were in November. Extension's Brian Williams joined me earlier. Well, how unusual is this? No changes to supply and demand estimates for corn or beans from month to month. Well, it wasn't a real big surprise. Um, when, we, when we sit down and kind of think about it, last month when the, the November report came out, a lot of the crops were in the, the, they were in the bins, they were finished harvesting. So we kind of had a real good picture on the supply side of what things are looking like. Mm -hmm. But on the demand side, it was a little bit surprising because usually there's almost always some at least minor changes. And this month there weren't. So let's recap the November numbers, which are now the official December numbers. Right, so just running through the numbers real quick. On the corn side of things, uh, yields were unchanged at 175.3 bushels per acre nationally. Uh, Mississippi yields were unchanged as well. Um, production was still at 15.2 billion bushels, which is a record crop uh, production-wise. And then ending stocks were at 2.4 billion bushels for corn. On uh, soybeans, again, the yields were unchanged at 52.5 bushels per acre. Uh, production was at a record 4.36 billion bushels. And then our ending stocks were unchanged at 480 million bushels. What's the market reaction to been, been to the unchanged numbers? I, I doubt they were expecting that, or were they? Well, there was, there was kind of an expectation for not any, too, any big surprises. So actually the markets initially reacted positively just because there weren't any surprises. Mm -hmm. um, but since then, on, so on Friday they were up. Since then they've kind of fallen back down um, today and, and are about where they were before the report came out. Did the report any cha indicate any change as far as the foreign competition, as far as bean and corn production? Yes, that was the one place that there were changes was globally, and it looks like we've, we've got a huge global crop to begin with on both corn and soybeans, and they increased that crop size even a little bit more in this last report. So because of that, the report's actually considered somewhat bullish or bearish. Final question, how much impact, if any, will this report have on planning decisions for 2017? I really don't think this report in particular is going to have too much of an impact. It really doesn't change our supply and demand situation. Um, so I think we're probably going to see fewer corn acres, maybe a little bit more soybean and a little bit more cotton. Speaking of cotton, the government did increase the size of our nation's cotton crop in that December 9th report. All U.S. production was bumped up by 2% from the November 1 figure. That brings the revised total national forecast to 16.5 million bales of cotton. Now here in Mississippi, the production forecast for this year was left unchanged from the November numbers. 1,100,000 bales remains the figure for the Magnolia State. Well, time for the trivia quiz on Farm Week. It's about our state's number one agricultural commodity. Here's the question. How much of U.S. chicken production is exported? The answer is one of the following, 10%, 16%, 22%, or 39%. We'll have that answer coming up shortly. We're going to pause for a short break, but don't go anywhere. Still ahead, Layton tells us why you may soon be trading in your morning Egg McMuffin for a little bit of chicken. And in today's feature story, people across Mississippi, they're saying, clean it up. 
The beach is one place you want to keep as beautiful as possible. See why these volunteers are devoting an entire afternoon to making the coast healthy one bag at a time. We're back after this. Why farmers markets? Why come here? Well, there's no doubt it tastes better. And heck, it's better for you too. Hooray, cantaloupe! Everywhere you look is great food. Healthy food. It's just a healthier choice and we like that it supports our community. The reason I come is because you just can't find this quality anywhere else. Hooray, farmers market! I want to take this opportunity to wish all of the Farm Week viewers a very Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Merry Christmas everyone and have a happy and safe New Year. Happy, happy Holidays! holidays. <laughs> miss you, Station Service. I still say it. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year from the Center for Technology Outreach. I'd like to wish all of you happy holidays and a happy new year. Happy holidays from the Division of Agriculture, Forestry, and Veterinary Medicine. Merry Christmas and best wishes for the holidays from CTO. Merry Christmas and happy holidays from the State 4-H staff. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas from all of us here on the Farm Week crew. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas, happy, happy holidays, holidays, and happy new year. year. Well, a brand new EPA projection is causing some concern for the U.S. poultry industry. It could mean the price of chicken feed, basically the price of corn, is going up. A revised volume for the renewable fuel standard from the EPA now calls for the production of about 200 million more gallons of ethanol from corn next year. That's about a 6% increase, and it means that the amount of corn set aside to make ethanol will have to go up. and that likely farmers will pay more in order to feed their chickens. Well, the breakfast menu at McDonald's may feature more chicken-related items in the future. What well, would be good for the chicken industry? Move over, Egg McMuffin. McDonald's is test marketing a chicken biscuit, a chicken McMuffin, and a chicken McGriddle at over 70 locations in Ohio. A spokesperson for the chain says it's yet premature to speculate on if or when any of these items might go on the menu nationwide. Well, 2016 will be remembered as a particularly volatile year at times for the nation's cattle industry. However, trader Sue Martin thinks better days are ahead for the beef sector in 2017. I see next year as a year where it gives you more opportunity, more of a, of a swing. This year, 2016 was a stair step down. Yes. And last year, 2015 was the slide. So I see next year as more of a stabilization and what have you. You know, exports um, for meat are gonna pick up. You've got avian bird flu hitting all over the place. You've got France, um, you've got uh, the Netherlands, Egypt, the okay. Ukraine. Uh, I think Germany might even be in that. And, and then you've got Russia with swine fever. Back to the trivia quiz now to wrap things up in the markets for this week. And the answer is B. In the first half of this year, the U.S. exported more than 16% of the chicken produced in this country. We're all familiar with the term, don't be a litter bug. Aside from being unsightly and often smelly, improperly discarding garbage can be very dangerous. To help combat the issue and educate the public about environmental hazards, the annual Mississippi Coastal Cleanup is held, covering the state's three Gulf Coast counties. Volunteers gather garbage and record each piece before disposing of it. Mississippi State University Extension assisted with this event, which is also an effort of the Mississippi Debris Task Force, as well as the Mississippi Department of Marine Resources.
It can easily be said that protecting the environment means protecting ourselves. For nearly three decades, the annual Mississippi Coastal Cleanup has helped achieve that purpose. Mississippi State University Extension Assistant Professor Dr. Eric Sparks says it's one of the largest volunteer efforts in the state with an estimated two to 4,000 volunteers each year. At the event, volunteers learn that environmental hazards go far beyond what they imagined. Birds or turtles can get tangled up and the, the classic is the six pack ring of a uh, of plastic that causes a lot of issues, but also fishing line and old discarded nets um, and even cans. What's a little less known is a lot of the plastic things that we discard break down over time into smaller and smaller pieces and they become what a lot of people call microplastics. And that stuff is so small that it can even get into uh, small organisms and filter feeding organisms like oysters, which are really important down here on the coast and cause a lot of harm through uh, blockages and then toxins. Birds and even large marine mammals like whales, they've been found to uh, have essentially starved to death by consuming things like plastics that looks like a lot of their prey items, but when it gets into their stomach, it can't get out and it has no nutritional value to them. So their stomach feels full but they have no nutrition and they end up actually starving to death. You may be wondering how the health of marine and wildlife impacts your own life. Dr. Sparks explains the most dangerous, direct effects we experience ourselves as a result of improperly discarding items. Most dangerous would to, you know, directly to humans would probably be a lot of glass items that can cause cuts and things like that. For things like uh, microplastics, uh, in oysters, it's a lot of ingesting toxins, which will then, you know, probably make it to you as you consume those things. Overall, I would say the plastics are more harming to us through the environment. So it gets into the environment um, and causes causes harm to the food webs and natural systems and that in turn affects us. And even for those of us not located near coastal regions, the same concept applies to both humans and animals. It may not seem like it affects you, but anything that you put in, out in the environment will eventually make its way down to the coast. So uh, any trash bag that you discard up upland somewhere, uh, even though it may seem like it stays in one place for a long time, it may break down pieces of it wash into a waterway, gets into rivers and comes down here, which again can cause uh, a lot of negative impacts on our coastal ecosystems. And most people enjoy things like seafood. As for debris and litter collected, Dr. Sparks says each piece is logged for future reference. It helps us figure out what the most abundant pieces of pollution are in our environment. It can help us target where we can focus our extension and education programs to make the most impact. Cigarette butts are the number one um, pollutant found alongside the, our beach waste. So um, cigarette butts, we've had people found an actual, found a syringe, um, glass, broken glass. Also, we've had a couple of um, just some dead fish and birds along the beach waste. The cool part about it is we've had a lot of young kids out here as well as, as young as four years old. So being active at an early age is very important. Stephen Jabot of Gulfport and Christine Davis of Biloxi explain what they've observed about environmental hazards to wildlife as well as humans. The waste that we leave could be really harmful for the ingestion so they can poison themselves. That poisons us because you know kids come out and they play in the water and I don't know if they want to walk in the water and find a dead fish floating around <laughs> or a bird. They can wind up the waste that's on the side of the beach that we have to mark out. Oh. It's bad for our water. Bacteria levels forming in within the water. A child may not stop and think, oh, well, look, you know, there's, there's some Fanta, some orange drink or something like that, and I like that, so let me go ahead and drink it. And, you know, there's bacteria and stuff in there. And there's broken glass and honestly some of the green pieces look kind of like you know a Jolly Rancher or some other kind of a candy. If they actually swallow and ingest it then you know uh, then you're looking at you know some pretty scary stuff to have to deal with. But I've learned a new respect, uh, a new appreciation for everything in the in the chain of our environment. 
when the animals die in our environment, then you know that takes out one of those levels in keeping nature going. You know, we need the grasses, uh, you know, to produce the oxygen and stuff, and we need the animals to and the uh, the little insects and creatures to eat those, so that uh, you know we keep the the grasses and what have you under control, and that they continue to propagate. And then we've got other animals that come in and eat those. If something gets a disease, you, know, you start talking about things like, uh, you know, the spread of disease. We want to keep them healthy so that we can stay healthy. The 2016 Mississippi Coastal Cleanup covered over 40 different locations throughout Hancock, Jackson, and Harrison counties. The event is part of Ocean Conservancy's International Cleanup. To help with the cleanup near you, visit oceanconservancy.org. To cultivate a healthy environment, small steps each day make a big difference. Instead of using disposable cups, drink from reusable bottles, cups, and coffee mugs. Keep lids on trash cans so garbage won't be dragged away by animals. Forego drinking from straws. Invest in reusable shopping bags. Turn glass bottles into works of art for your home or gift items. And of course, don't litter. Learn what items can be recycled and where to take them. Mississippi State University Extension's Master Naturalist Program offers many exciting events and opportunities for cleaning up our environment. To learn more, visit masternaturalist.extension.msstate.edu. I'm Amy Myers reporting. And the total amount calculated for trash uh, this year picked up weighed over 12 tons. That's 24,000 pounds. Wow, amazing. Uh, and something else to remember, Dr. Sparks says by the year 2050, there will be more plastic in the world's oceans than fish if we don't substantially clean up our act. Mm. That's an alarming thought. Mm -hmm. Well, an event going on almost 30 years seems to get bigger each year. Thank yes. you, Amy. And of course, you can head over to MississippiCoastalCleanup.org for information about the 2017 event. All right, that's going to do it for us this week. We'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us.